Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah amma ba'd. Brothers, come forward, inshallah. Come close. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, referring to the day of judgment, Yawma yaqoomu nasu li rabbil alameen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, on that day, when all of the people will be standing in front of their Lord. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Lord of all that exists. Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhum, the son of Umar ibn Khattab, one night he was reciting his ayah again and again and again in the prayer at night. يَوْمَ يَقُومُ النَّاسُ لِرَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ On the day when the people will stand before their Lord. And he kept repeating this ayah, scared and petrified with regards to the reality of what it entails. He burst into tears the whole night, weeping and crying, remembering the fact that he will be standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, accounting in what situation, accounting himself, in what situation will he be when he stands before Allah? What will have ha his hands have earned? What will ha our hands have earned when we stand before Allah? We will stand before him with the sins, or we stand before him with the good deeds. The standing on the day of judgment is something very scary. On the day of judgment, brothers, and if there's any sisters that are listening, many things happen. On the day of judgment, people get accounted. On the day of judgment, people are questioned. On the day of judgment, the scaling takes place. On the day of judgment, people come out of their graves. On the day of judgment, the sun is above their heads. On the day of judgment, the paradise is there, the hellfire is there. So much is taking place. Allah descends, you speak to Allah. The believers speak to Allah. The kuffar are resurrected blind. So much is taking place. But wallahi, it is scary enough to ignore all of that which I've mentioned and just to talk about how it will be when you stand before Him. Just what it's like, just the standing. Just you standing before Allah. We could do a whole lecture. We could do a whole series just on what it's going to be like to stand on that day. So inshallah, we'll take some hadith pertaining to standing on the day of judgment. The day, brothers, sisters, wallahi, Wallahi, you see your feet with which you walk. These same two feet will be standing on the Day of Judgment one day. 10 years, 20 years, 100 years, 1000 years, however long it takes, that day is going to come. We're going to stand. With these feet we walk towards haram, with these feet we do all sorts of things, sometimes good, sometimes bad. One day Allah is going to make a stand with these two feet on that plane of Yawm Al Qiyamah. So let's learn a bit about what it's going to be like so we can prepare ourselves for that. The first thing we mentioned, inshallah ta'ala, is that the people will be standing in their sweat. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the hadith is sahih, he said, an Umar ibn Khattab, an, um, an Abdullah ibn Umar, he narrated, an al Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, yawma yaqoomu nasu li rabbil alameen. The Prophet mentioned this verse that I just mentioned to you. And then how did he explain it about the people standing? He said what it means, the Prophet said, qal, he said, yaqoomu ahaduhum fi rashihi ila ansafi udhunayh. That the people will be standing on that day, and they'll be in their sweat. And some of them are going to be drowning in their sweat. Some of them, the Prophet has mentioned, the sweat is going to be up way to, halfway towards their ears. Towards their ears. And why is this going to be? Because we know that the sun will be above the people's heads. The sun that we see in this heat, that we see so clearly now that it's summertime, it will be above our heads. And the people will start to sweat. Some of them in other narrations mentioned the sweat will be just down towards their ankles. Some of them, the sweat will be higher. Well, why, why is the sweat differing? Because of the sins. The ones whose sins are very little, they'll have a little puddle of sweat around their ankles. The ones whose sins are high, they're going to be drowning in their sweat. It's going to be up to their ears. A side point to mention, this will happen for so long. And we know the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that there is going to be seven categories of people who will receive a shade on that day of judgment when there'll be no shade. They will be shaded. Allah will shade them. What is the hadith about? It's the sun. It's the sun that's causing them to drown. Who are those who will be shaded on the day? There are seven categories that I mentioned. But I want to mention just one of them. Because it's relevant to a lot of you being youngsters. Young brothers with a lot of energy. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, one of those who is going to be shaded from this is a young person. A young boy. A woman approaches him. She's got beauty. But not just beauty, she's also got honor. She's got prestige. She's a woman who's a bit high maintenance. 
She's not some ordinary woman off the block. She's, she's a very noble woman. And she offers herself to him. She says, come, me and you, we're going to do zina. And what does he do? He rejects her. He rejects her because he remembers Allah. Like Yusuf alayhi salam. When the woman she came to him, قالت, hey, talak. she said, come, let's do it now. Rather, Allah said before that, she barricaded the door shut. She didn't just lock it. Allah said, وَغَلَّقَتِ الْأَبْوَابِ She locked the door shut. She made sure no one's coming through. She padlocked it, chained it, put No one's going to come through. And she said, me and you, we're going to do it now. And Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah, mentioned, when he's explaining on the next page of the surah, not under this particular ayah, but of the same surah to Yusuf, the issue of Yusuf, on the next page, he mentioned this woman was not ordinary woman. She was the, she was the wife of the Aziz, of one of the, one of, one of the political leaders of the time. Yeah, are they going to marry some ugly chick? His, his wife is going to be beautiful, right? So she's a beautiful woman. She's honorable, noble. She's got lineage. She's got authority. And not only that, no one can see. It's no one can see. He's going to do it. If he does it with her, no, no one will be able to, 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 to know. But Yusuf remembered Allah knows. Allah. He said, I seek refuge in Allah from this. And then he ran to the door. And then when he ran to the door, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he saved him. Allah caused the door to burst open. Miracle from Allah. Allah caused the door to burst open and the woman's husband was standing right there. And Yusuf was saved. And then later on what happened? Later on she tried to trap him again. She tried to trap him again. This time she brought a whole bunch of women. A whole bunch of women. Because they started talking about this woman on the streets. They started saying, look at this woman. She, because Yusuf was her servant. He was a slave boy. So they were like, look at this woman, she's supposed to be noble and she went for her slave boy. Look, she went for her slave boy. So what did she do? She, she, wanted to, she wanted to show these women. It wasn't any ordinary slave boy that I went for. This is Yusuf, the Prophet told us half the world's beauty was placed in his face. Half the world's beauty was placed in his face. Yeah? It was him. So, فَلَمَّا سَمِعَتْ بِمَكْرِهِنَّ When she heard of what they were saying, فَأَرْسَلَتْ إِلَيْهِنَّ وَأَعْتَدَتْ لَهُنَّ مُتَّكَأَ وَأَعْتَدْ كُلَّ وَاحِدَةٍ مِنْهُنَّ سِكِّينًا وَقَالَ تِخْرُجَ عَلَيْهِنْ She called them. When she heard what she did, she made a little gathering. She gave each one of them knives. She gave them knives. She gave them vegetables or something to cut. They were cutting, chopping. You know like women get together, they do a little cooking kind of thing. So they're chopping. وَقَالَ تِخْرُجَ عَلَيْهِنْ She said, bring Yusuf. Tell him to come in. Just tell him to, tell him to walk by. Just walk by. Walk by the room. When he walked by the room, these, pe- pe- these women, they cut right through their fingers. Why did they cut through their fingers? They, as they're chopping, he comes to the room, this beautiful man. They don't realize, they start chopping up their hands. Their hands are bleeding. They don't realize. They do not realize their hands are bleeding. And they just, they, they, their hands are bleeding, they still don't realize. They, they just start praising him. Subhan, it's not a man. Hada Malikun Kareem. This is an honorable angel. They started saying. That's what he was like. So the woman she says, This is what you were blaming me for. The way you are chopping up your hands, you blame me for him. This is why I wanted him. And she said, Now if he doesn't give me what I want, meaning if he doesn't do zina with me, if he doesn't sleep with me now, I'm gonna send him to jail. I'm gonna send him to prison. And he's gonna become from the low ones. So now Yusuf's thinking, Subhan, what is this? I ran away from her one and the door was locked. Now I've got all these women and they're all looking there. Look at, imagine how freaky they are. They've cut through their own fingers. They want him. So what does he do at that time? He makes dua. He says, Rabbi, asijnu, ahabba ilayya mimma yadu'unani ilay. He said, my Lord, prison is more beloved to me than what they're calling me to. He said, I would rather go to prison than sleep with a woman. That's haram for me. So what's he doing? He's actually making dua, Allah send me to prison. Send me to prison, Ya Allah, send me to prison. And Allah said, in the next ayah, Allah responded to his dua. He responded to his dua, Allah put him in jail. Ibn Kathir, he mentioned on the tafsir of this ayah, why did Allah put him in jail? The reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put him in jail was because it was to save him. 
It was to save him. Because the woman wanted to do haram with him so badly, she was going to keep finding a way to get him. So in order to protect Yusuf السلام, completely, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took him and put him in jail. Jail was a blessing for him. It was a protection for him from what he's going through. And then subhanAllah, again, a bit more of a side note. Then this touched me. Because one of the brothers that we're close with recently got arrested. After he changed his life and he fixed himself, changed his ways, started practicing, came to the deen strong. And recently got arrested for something that happened a long time ago. Allah will accept your repentance, but the queen won't. So they'll prosecute you. And I was thinking to myself, subhanAllah, what could be the hikmah behind this? And I thought to myself, subhanAllah, the same way Allah was protecting Yusuf السلام, by putting him in jail. It wasn't because Allah was punishing Yusuf. It was actually Allah was blessing him with jail. Maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was protecting our brother from that which he might have to face if he wasn't in prison. Maybe it was a protection for him as well. That's from the wisdom of Allah. But coming back to the point, is that Yusuf السلام, he rejected this woman of beauty and honor. And anyone who follows that pattern, he follows that path, will also be able to be from those ones who fall under the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day where there will be no shade. Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah said, why did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mention that the people, that the, the, the woman specifically is beautiful and she's got honor? She's beautiful and she's noble. Why? Because it's not every beautiful woman that you want to be with, right? Imagine there's a beautiful woman, but you know she's a prostitute, or she know, you know she's, she's a loose girl, and she, uh, half of the block have been with her. In your mind, no matter how beautiful she is, you're going to think, a bit disgusting, isn't it? It's, she's a bit of a low kind of peasant girl. But if it's a woman with, she's a princess. It's a woman of, of prestige. And she's beautiful. To say no to that is even harder. But these people will lie, that's why their reward is going to be so big. And the reason I wanted to focus on his brothers is because this is one of the things that you can attain. You're young right now. Those seven categories of being under the shade, this is one of the ones you can have today. We're in the summertime right now. Every day I know the fitness is real. You're bumping into women, girls are approaching you, reaching out to you, DMing you on Instagram. Somehow she finds your WhatsApp even after you've changed and starts messaging you. Shaitan's like that, he'll send girls to you when you change your life. He knows. That's why Sa'id Sa ibn Musayyib rahimullah, Sa'id ibn Musayyib rahimullah, he said that when shaitan cannot stop you from doing anything, he can't stop you from praying, he can't stop you from fasting, he can't stop you from all the righteous deeds, he can't make you do haram, then he sends his biggest weapon, which is the woman. He sends his biggest weapon, which is the woman, to finish you off. So if you're on guard with this, when you stand before Allah, when everyone else is drowning in their sweat, inshallah, you can be in the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's throne on that day. The second thing about standing is that you'll be standing on that day in the way when you were born. You won't be a baby, but you'll be the way you were born. I'll explain what that means. And Ibn Abbas radiyallahu anhuma, the noble companion narrated, قال, قام فينا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم خطيبا بموعظتين. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, one day he stood up to give a khutbah. He wanted to give a reminder, a mu'idha. A mu'idha is a reminder that touches the hearts. It's a reminder about the akhirah and something to increase your iman and bring strength to your iman. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stood to give such a reminder. And look what he said. He said, Ya ayyuhal nas. He said, O people, innakum tuhsharuna ila Allah. You are going to be gathered before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In what state? Hufatan. You're going to be barefooted. No sandals, no socks, no shoes, barefooted. Uratin, you're going to be naked. In another narration, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, when she heard this, she said, Ya Rasul, we're going to be naked. Who is Aisha? Aisha was a very modest woman. She was so, so shy that, you know, the Prophet was buried in, 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 her, in, in the house of Aisha because the Prophets are buried where they die. Wherever the Prophet dies, you have to bury him there. Because the Prophet died in the house of Aisha radiallahu anha, he was buried in that house. Then Abu Bakr, who was Aisha's father when he died, he was buried right next to the Prophet. Umar, 
wanted to be buried next to them as well, in the house of Aisha. Now the Prophet is Aisha's husband. Abu Bakr is Aisha's father. Umar has no relation to Aisha. He's a strange man. But when he died and was buried in the house, inside of her own house, she used to wear the niqab. She used to wear the niqab inside of her own house. This man is dead. Radiallahu anhu. She doesn't have to cover in front of a dead body. But she's still doing it because that was her shyness, that was her modesty, that was her haya. So understanding what she was like, you can understand why she's asking this question. She's shocked, we're going to be naked. And the Prophet ﷺ told her, Aisha, the matter is not like that. On that day, people are going to be so scared. They're not going to be concerned. The fact that they're naked. Well, I imagine that, Allah, brothers. Billah alayk, I beg you, just picture this. Imagine walking the streets naked. You can't focus. You're embarrassed. You feel humiliated. Not just that, women naked, you think, subhanAllah, fitna. On that day, you'll be so scared. You'll be so scared of what's awaiting you in terms of this accounting that you're going to stand before Allah. You'll be so petrified that you being naked and the people around you being naked is not going to concern you. It's not going to harm you. You're going to be so engaged in the situation at hand. Not just that, you're going to be uncircumcised. You're going to go back to your original form, uncircumcised. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa recited the ayah where Allah said, كَمَا بَدَأْنَا أَوَّلَ خَلْقٍ نُعِيدُهُ وَعْدًا عَلَيْنَا إِنَّا كُنَّا فَاعِلِينَ How Allah, Allah said, just like how Allah originally started your creation, barefooted, naked, uncircumcised, Allah said, نُعِيدُهُ We will return you back to that same stage. We're going to return you back to that same stage on a day of judgment. وَعْدًا This is a promise. Does Allah need to say promise? We would have believed him even if he didn't say promise. But he's, uh, the fact that Allah is saying, I promise. So there's no doubt inside of your heart. So your certainty further increases that you're going to stand in that way. And Allah said, Inna kunna fa'ilin. Allah will do that. And then Allah said, Allah, wa inna awwal al khala'iqi yuksa yawm al qiyamah, Ibrahim alayhi salam. And the first person who's going to be given clothes to wear on the day of judgment before anyone else is going to be Ibrahim. Why? Because when Ibrahim was thrown into the fire, what happened to him? His clothes they burnt. So because his clothes burnt and he became naked there, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is on the day of judgment going to make him the first person who's clothed before anyone else. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The people who opposed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the people who opposed Allah, the kuffar, how are they going to stand on the Day of Judgment? They're going to stand on their faces. The believers are going to stand how? On their feet. The kuffar are going to stand on their faces. Now you might think to yourself, how does a person stand on his face? Not head. Not head. Not the ras. Not their ru'us. Their face. They're going to stand on their face. How? How will you stand on your face? This is humiliation, Wallahi. One Sahabi asked the same question. She said, Ya Nabi Allah, O Prophet of Allah, Kayfa yuhsharu al kafiru ala wajhi? How is it that the kafir will be on his face on a day of judgment? How? It doesn't make, it doesn't make sense. I understand a person standing on his feet, but how is he standing on his face? And the Prophet said, Alayhi salladhi amshahu ala raju, ala, ala rijalaini. فِي الدُّنْيَا قَادِرًا عَلَىٰ أَنْ يُمْشِيَهُ عَلَىٰ وَجْهِ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ The Prophet ﷺ said, the same one who made him walk in his feet in this life in the first place, does he not have the ability to make him walk on his face on the Day of Judgment? I mean, this is Allah. Allah does what He wants. فَعَلُوا لِمَا يُرِيدُ He does whatever He intends, he, whatever He wills. وَاللَّهُ عَلَىٰ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ He has ability over everything. The same way He made you have feet to walk on, He's now going to make your face a means for you to walk on. And that will happen to the disbelievers. Humiliation, wallahi. <coughs> Humiliation. Walking on their face. The face is the most honorable, noble part. They didn't want to take their faces and make sajda with it in this life. They were arrogant. They didn't want to take their face, which is the most noble part of the face, and humble and humiliate themselves before their Lord by bowing down in sajda. They don't want to pray. They're salah. They don't want to do that. So now Allah is going to make them 
He's going to force them to be on their face. He's going to force them to be on their face. They're going to walk on their face on the day of judgment. And brothers, pay attention. This is something very powerful. You have to understand that whether you listen to Allah or not, whether you obey Him or not, you will submit to Him. Allah mentioned everything in the heavens and earth will submit to Allah, either willingly or unwillingly. Allah told you to submit willingly in this life. And if you don't listen, Allah will make you submit on that day. The same way the kafir doesn't want to pray. The guy you tell him pray. And pay, pay attention. As I mentioned many times before, the one who doesn't pray is a kafir. The one who doesn't pray his five daily prayers is a murtad. His kufr, yanqulu anil millah, it takes him outside of this religion. This is an ijma amongst the sahaba, consensus. Consensus, which means no two companions ever disagreed. The Prophet said, what is the difference between a believer and a kafir and, a, and, and shirk, and kufr and shirk, is the prayer. So the difference between a believer and, the, and shirk and kufr is salah. So if, they're not, if he's not praying, is there a difference between him and a kafir? There's no difference. So you don't want to submit by praying your five daily prayers. Wallahi Allah will make you submit on the day of judgment by making you walk on your face on that day. And then the submission will only increase. The person will go to hell for eternity. When they fall into the hellfire, it will be asked them, مَا سَلَقَكُمْ فِي سَقَرْ What has brought you into the hellfire? What has brought you here? And they will say, لَمْ نَكُمْ مِنَ الْمُصَلِّينَ We were those who never prayed. We never prayed our, our prayers. And that's why we're here. So the prayer is not something that you miss. <coughs> and on that day, brothers, while all this is happening, the sun is above you, you're roasting, you're sweating, you're naked. Everyone's running around, screaming, don't know what's happening. You're waiting. You're waiting, you're waiting, you're waiting for Allah to start the Day of Judgment. You know that famous hadith, when the people will run to Nuh, so they run to Adam and they'll say, Adam, you're the first man that Allah created. Allah creates you with His own hands. Ask Allah for the Day of Judgment to start. And Adam will say, I ate from the tree. Don't ask me. Go and ask someone else. They, then they will go to Nuh. And Nuh will say, they will say, you were the first messenger who Allah sent to the people. You were the first messenger Allah sent to the people. Ask Allah to start the day of judgment. And Nuh, they will say, they will say intercede, intercede to Allah for us. And Nuh will say, I questioned Allah one time. Because he asked Allah when Allah killed his son. Allah caused his son to drown and he said, Allah, you said you will save my family and my son was from my family. And Allah told him, your son was not from your family. Rather, your son was a, was a, was a non-righteous action. Allah told him, don't question me. Don't question me, don't argue against me. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he rebuked him for questioning him. So he got scared. He said, I'm not going to... The prophets will be scared that day, brothers. And Allah said, وَكُلُّ أُمَّةٍ جَاثِيَةٍ Every nation will be on their knees. Ibn Kathir mentioned in the tafsir of that, that even the prophets will be on their knees. Ibrahim will fall on his knees and he will say, Allah, I'm your friend. Don't forget, I'm your friend. Isa alayhi will start screaming, will start shouting, say, Allah, take my mom. Free me, take my mom. These are prophets. So on that day, everyone will fall to their knees. Even prophets are going to be scared. So the Nuh will say, don't come to me. And he will say, nafsi, nafsi, I'm just concerned about myself, myself. Then they go to Musa. And when they go to Musa, they will say, Musa, you are the one Allah personally spoke to you. Allah communicated to you, he spoke to you. And Musa will say, I killed a man. Because he accidentally he killed the man when he was trying to save the person. He was trying to stop the fight and he accidentally killed him. He will say, nafsi, nafsi. Allah is angry in a way that he's never been angry before. He will say, myself, myself, I'm only concerned with myself. So then they will go to Isa alayhi salam. And again, Isa will say, nafsi, nafsi. And then they go to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will make sajda. And Allah will teach the Prophet how to praise Allah. To show you the people who, of, of shirk, wallahi. They say, oh, the reason we make dua to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is because the Prophet is going to intercede for us on the Day of Judgment. Even when the Prophet intercedes, it is Allah who will inspire him of how to praise Allah. And he will praise Allah in a way that Allah has never been praised before. Allah has not been praised, ne the Prophet has never praised him like that before Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then Allah will start the Day of Judgment. Why did I tell you this hadith? To show you brothers, sisters who might be listening, this hadith is only talking about the people are panicking. Why? They just want the day to start. The, the standing is so long. 
The standing is so painful. The standing is such a torment. The standing is a punishment enough. The reason why they're running to the prophets, they're saying, just tell Allah to start the day. This is not, oh Allah, tell Allah to forgive us. This shafa'ah, this intercession is not them asking, saying, Allah, forgive us. This shafa'ah is Allah, just ask Allah, Ya Rasulullah, just ask Allah to start the day. Because the standing is so painful. We we'll mentioned, inshallah ta'ala, a long hadith, and we'll end with this. Because the hadith is long. And the hadith is in Al Bukhari. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was asked by his companions, they said, Will we see Allah? Will we be able to see Allah on the Day of Judgment? And the, to show you the concern of the Sahaba, they wanted to see Allah. They were concerned about seeing. They were concerned about seeing their Lord. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said the same way when you look at the sun or the moon on a clear night. The same way Sorry, when you, yeah, when you, uh, you have no difficulty in seeing the sun and the moon on a clear night, the same way you will see Allah. Like, you know at night when there's clouds are clear, there's no fogginess in the sky, you see the moon clearly, right? I see the same way you can see the moon clearly, you will see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And by the way, because the Ash'aris, they like to get excited here, the ones who deny Allah's names and attributes, they say, what do they say? They say, we are trying to compare Allah to the moon, and we're saying Allah is like the moon. No, we don't say that. The Prophet is not saying that Allah look, is like the moon. Rather, he's saying, looking at the moon is like looking at Allah. Meaning the clarity of vision of the moon, that is what he's comparing to the clarity of vision to seeing Allah. He's not comparing Allah to the moon. He's, clearing the, he's, he's comparing the looking of the moon to the looking of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Does that make sense? Barakallahu feekum. So, then the Prophet sallallahu said, you'll be able to see him. And then the Prophet went on to explain the day even further. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, someone will announce to people who are standing on the Day of Judgment, they will say, let every nation go to that which they used to worship. So the people who used to worship the cross will go to the cross. The people who used to worship the idols will go to the idols. Everyone will go to their gods. The Hindus will go to Ganesh. They'll split up, some will go to Ganesh, some will go to Lakshmi, some will go to Vishnu and all them other ones. And then you have the Buddhists, they'll go to Buddha. They'll go to their Buddha, they'll go to their God. And the Christians will go to their cross. And everyone will go except the believers they'll remain. The believers who are righteous and the believers who are sinners. And a group from amongst the people of the book, the Ahlul Kitab. And then, as they're standing there, the believers and this group from the Ahlul Kitab, the hellfire will be brought. But the hellfire will be brought in the form of a mirage. A mirage, you know when it's hot, you think it's, a, it look, it's, it's something that you think is there, but it's not there. Like an oasis in the desert. You think there's water to drink from, right? But when you go there, you realize what? There was nothing there. So the hellfire will come in the form of a mirage. They will think that it's safety for them, huh? And then it will be asked to them, the Jews will be said, who did you worship? And they never worshipped Allah. They used to worship Uzair or Ezra, as it is in the Old Testament, if I'm not mistaken. So they will say, we worshipped Uzair ibn Allah. We worship Uzair, who is the son of Allah. And then it will be said to them, you are liars. Because Allah had no wife, and Allah had no son. Then it will be said, what do you want right now? And they will say, we just, we just want to drink. That oasis, they see it, just give us something to drink. They will be said, okay, go drink. And as they go towards the oasis, remember it's the hellfire. They're going to fall into the fire. And they're going to be burnt there for eternity, never to come out. Then the Christians will be spoken to. And they'll be said, who did you worship? And they will say, Isa ibn Maryam. So Isa ibn Allah, they will say. Jesus, the son of God. They'll be told, you're liars. Allah had no wife and Allah had no son. What do you want? They will be asked. Same thing they will say, because they see the awake, they see the, awake the mirage. They will say, give us something to drink. They'll be told, go drink. And as they go, Again, they'll drop. They'll fall into the hellfire. And then the believers will remain. And when the believers remain, I told you, these are the righteous ones, the ones who used to worship Allah, and even the sinners are there. The mischievous ones. 
And when they remain, and they, remember, everyone's gone to their gods. Everyone's gone. Just the believers are left. And then it will be asked, it will be said, what keeps you here? And where, what keeps you here when everyone else has gone? Why have you not gone to who you worship? The believers will be asked, why have you not gone to who you worship? And the believers will say, we're not following these people. In this life, in the dunya when we lived, we needed these Christians, we needed these kuffar, we needed these atheists. We separated from them in this life. If we separated them on the dunya, do you think we're going to be with them on the day of judgment? We're not going to be with them. Let them go to their gods. They say, we're standing here because we're waiting for our Lord. Because they were told what? Go to your gods. Go to that which you worship. So they will say, we are waiting for your Lord. And then Allah will come. But Allah will come to them in a form that they don't recognize Him. Allah will come to them in a form they don't recognize Him. Allah will say to them, I am your Lord. No one will speak. Only the prophets will speak to Allah. Everyone's confused because they don't recognize him. So Allah will say to the prophets, Do you have a sign by which you will recognize your Lord? And they will say, Yes. The sign is the shin. Allah will show us his shin. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, يَوْمَ يُكْشَفُ عَنْ سَاقٍ On the day, Allah will unveil his shin. Remember? Allah has a shin, we have a shin. But our shin is not like Allah's shin. The same way, do I have a hand? Does Allah have a hand? Does the clock have a hand? My hand and the clock's hand is different. If my hand and the clock hand is different, and they're in this life, then of course my hand and Allah hand, Allah's hand is going to be different. We share the same name, but not the same essence. So don't think this is like your shin or my shin. You're not allowed to do that. So the shin will be unveiled. And when the shin is unveiled, this was the sign they were waiting for. All of the believers will make sajda. Everyone will, they will say, this is our Lord. Allah has come. Everyone will make sajda, they'll fall into prostration. But I told you there was two groups of believers, right? The ones who worshipped Allah and the ones who didn't worship Allah. As in, they worshipped Him, but they were sinners, they were mischievous people, they were evil people. The ones who used to worship Allah in this life, they're the ones who fall into sajda easy. The ones who didn't worship Allah, they used to sin a lot and do all sorts of madness. They will want to make sajda, but Allah will make their back stiff. Like you know the back is made up of several bones. And because they're all tiny bones, they're able to move and give you flexibility and, 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 and mobility, sorry. But Allah will make it one thing, like one plank of wood. They want to make sajda, but they won't be able to do it. As Allah said, يَوْمَ يُكْشَفُ عَنْ سَاقٍ وَيُدْعَوْنَ إِلَى السُّجُودِ فَلَا يَسْتَطِيعُونَ On that day when the shin is unveiled, they will be told to make sajda. They will be called to make sajda. فَلَا يَسْتَطِيعُونَ But they will not be able to do it. Wallahi, that's so scary, man. You, 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 you're seeing it in front of you. Allah has come. So now you want to humiliate yourself before Him. Allah will not give you that. He didn't do it in this life. He won't give it to you. He won't give it to you. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then what happens right after that? The bridge will be thrown across the hellfire. Hellfire is already there. We said, remember, it came. I mean, it was in the form of a mirage. Now, a bridge will be thrown. A bridge for us to get to paradise. Because the believers are here. Allah wants to take them to Jannah. So how are they going to get to Jannah? Hellfire is in the middle. Allah will throw a bridge out. Uh, Allah will throw, a, 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 a bridge will be thrown out. The companions, they, when they heard this, they asked the Prophet what is this bridge? And the Prophet he described it. Look at this. He said the bridge is slippery. Number one. Number two, it has clamps. Number three, it has hooks. These hooks on one end of the hook is very wide. On the other end of the hook, it's very thin, it's very narrow. And on the hook, there are thorns with bent ends. Look how scary that is. Like, you know, if you take a knife that's got a curl in it, you stab someone with it and you pull it out, what happens? It, it doesn't just go in and out. It goes in and it brings out what's inside the person. 
Because it's got a hook at the end. So you've got these hooks, and they've got thorns on the hooks, and the thorns are bent. Who are the first people that are going to be grabbed when they try to walk on that bridge? The ones who didn't pray. I keep mentioning the prayer, brothers, because then another hadith the Prophet said, if your prayer is good, then everything after it is going to be good on the Day of Judgment. But if your prayer is bad, then everything else is going to be bad. Everything else is going to fail it on the Day of Judgment. And pay attention. This is one of the scariest verses in the Quran. Allah said, Wa in minkum illa wariduha. Allah said, Every single one of you. Allah speaking to us directly. Allah didn't say, Wa in min, wa, uh, Allah didn't say, Wa in minhum. Allah said, Wa in minkum. Every single one of you. Allah, Allah is not talking about us in the third person. Allah is talking to us directly. Allah said, Every single one of you is going to come to the hellfire on the day of judgment. You'll all be brought to it. Even the believers are going to be brought to it. No one is going to escape the hellfire. Everyone's going to come to it. This is a promise Allah made upon Himself. Certainty. There was a man from the Salaf. He used to cry every night. He used to cry profusely. He used to cry as if he murdered someone. So every night he's crying, he's crying. His mom went to him and he said, My son, why are you crying? She said, Did you murder someone? She said, if you murder someone, the way you're crying so much, 100% Allah is forgiving you. He's trying to calm him down, thinking you must have done something mad. She said, whatever it is, this crying is a repentance that's sincere. Allah is forgiving you. And he said, mom, I'm not crying because I've murdered someone. I'm crying because Allah said, everyone's going to come to the hellfire. And Allah said, This is to Allah is a promise with certainty. What is this talking about? It's talking about the bridge. It's talking about the, the bridge. How will they come to it? Because they're going to go over the bridge and the bridge, the hellfire is going to be underneath it. Then Allah told you, who are the ones who are going to make it past the bridge? Everyone's going to come to the hellfire, <coughs> but there are some who are going to be saved. Allah said in the next verse, Allah said, then after that we will save the people of taqwa. The people who had taqwa, the people who had piety, who had fear. And if you came to the Ramadan lectures, I kept repeating what taqwa was. What was taqwa? Is that you? Protect yourself from Allah's anger by doing what He commanded you and staying away from what He prohibited you. And the whole point of Ramadan was to build taqwa in you. And if you took Ramadan serious, inshallah you have benefited yourself with some taqwa. And if you haven't, then you need to start working hard now. Because you will not be saved from the hellfire unless you have taqwa on that day. And then Allah said, when it comes to crossing the bridge, the believers are different. The Prophet said, some of them are going to cross through like the wink of an eye. The same way you blink, they're going to be through like that. Some of them are going to go as quick as lightning, which is a bit slower than an eye blink. Some of them are going to go like a strong wind. Winds sometimes go hundreds of miles an hour. Sometimes they're going to go like a, some of the believers are going to go like a fast horse. Some of them are going to go like a camel through the bridge. So this is depending on the righteousness of the people. The one who's got more khair will go through like lightning, like a blink of an eye. But the ones who are slow, or sinners, they're going to be like that. Some of the people are going to go through the prophecy without any scratches. They're not going to, be, they're not going to have one scratch on them. And some of them are going to receive scratches. Some of them are going to be cut. When they get to the other side, they're going to be cut and wounded. They're going to be crawling, getting through slowly. Just ripped apart because the, the bridge finished them. And then there will be those. And these are believers, by the way. These are believers. These are those, some of them prayed. Some of them prayed. There are those who are going to fall off the bridge. They're going to fall into the hellfire. They're going to be burnt in there. Now look what happens. When the believers make it to the other side and they notice some of our Muslim brothers fell into the hellfire to show you the, the way believers come in beneficial. This is why Allah told you to be with the righteous people. This is why the Prophet told you to have righteous friends. Imagine you have no righteous friends. How will you be? You, might, you, know, you might not have people to recognize you. But these believers, they'll recognize. They'll start making dua to Allah. They'll start begging Allah. They'll start calling upon Allah. They will say, Allah, some of our brothers have been thrown into the fire. Allah, they were with us. 
Allah they used to pray with us. The believers will start crying out for us. They'll start crying out for the ones who've been thrown. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will listen to them. Allah will say, Go and take out from the fire anyone who in their heart has even a gold coin worth of iman, a gold coin worth of faith. That's very small, a little coin, gold coin. So the believers will go and they'll take out whoever they can. Then they'll come back to Allah and then Allah will say, go and take out anyone who's got even half of a gold coin, bring them out. Then when they bring them out, they'll, Allah will say to them, go back and take out anyone who's even got an atom's weight, bring them out. An atom! It's not visible to the naked eye. Allah will say, bring them out. And how will they be identified? From the marks on their forehead. Because they used to pray. The, their faces, their forehead, they'll have a little thing shining at Iman. That's why I told you, these are people who prayed. The ones who prayed, they will never come out of the hellfire. They're kuffar. This shows you that the ones who didn't pray are kuffar because they would, their heads will not have nothing on them. The ones who had this little atom, the minimum they did is they prayed. So they'll be brought out. And then after that, the prophets will intercede. And then the angels will intercede. And when everyone has been taken out of the hellfire, everyone's been taken out of the hellfire, then Allah will say, everyone's interceded. The believers have interceded, the prophets have interceded, the angels have interceded. Now, Allah Himself will intercede. And Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will grab some that are in the hellfire. Allah will grab them, will take them out. And by paradise there will be a little river. And they'll be thrown into the river. And this is called the, the river of Hayat, the river of life. The moment they're thrown into this river, the water when it touches them, it will start to revitalize them. And they will grow the same way a plant grows on a seabed. Very fast, quickly they'll grow. And they'll look like pearls. They'll grow on the banks and they will look like pearls. They will come out looking like pearls from the river. Like, you know the river it has, it has some pearls, right? The sea has pearls. They'll look like pearls just came out of the river. And they'll be told to enter into paradise. And these people, specifically this last group of people, they will have special necklaces that they'll be wearing. Special necklaces. They'll look different to everyone else. They won't look the same. Why? Because these are the last people who came out of the hellfire. So the people who are already in Jannah will say, these are uta, uta, uta Rahman. These are the ones who Allah freed. These are the ones who done no righteous actions. They did no good. And Allah he freed them and He took them into paradise. They have that special name. Now pay attention. Because they said they have no righteous actions, doesn't mean they didn't pray. They did pray. Other evidences show you the minimum that they were always doing was praying. They were always praying their five daily prayers. But even though they were praying, they were sinning. So they might have spent 30 years, 100 years in the hellfire. They were burnt, ripped apart. But Allah took them, He threw them in the river of life. They grew. And now they come into paradise. And everyone says, These are Utaqa ar Rahman. These are the special people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved. And then they will live in paradise for eternity in ecstasy, enjoying themselves. But while that is taking place, the people who are in the hellfire will be in the hellfire, burning for eternity the same way. Brothers, two things I want you to benefit from right now. If you say La ilaha illallah but you don't know what it means, you will go to the hellfire for eternity. You will not be from the people that gets taken out at the end. And if you don't pray, you will not be taken out. The minimum that you have to do to be from this group of people, the absolute minimum that you have to do. Because remember, Iman is in three places. Iman is in the heart, Iman is in the tongue, and the Iman is on the limbs. The minimum that you need to do, as Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah they believe, is you need to believe what? That which is in Hadith Jibreel. The six pillars of Iman. Belief in Allah, the angels, the messengers, the books, the day of judgment, the qadr, the good and the bad of it. You believe this in a way it deserves to be believed in, 
you have the right belief. That's the minimum. What's the minimum on your tongue? La ilaha illallah. But you have to say it knowing what it means and knowing what it implies. You have to know its conditions. You have to know its pillars. That's why, again, I say, brothers, all the time, seeking knowledge is very important. You can't just go to paradise and you never study this religion in your life. When Allah said, when Allah told you, Annahu la ilaha illallah, when he told you about la ilaha illallah, he said, Fa'lam before it. He said, seek knowledge. Have edu-. He didn't say seek knowledge, sorry. He commanded you have knowledge of la ilaha illallah. Pay attention. This ayah came down in Medina where Allah was talking to Sahaba, Abu Bakr, Umar. Did they not know what la ilaha illallah was? Of course they did. They learned it in Mecca for 13 years. Ma'adalika, even with that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is still telling them to carry on learning about la ilaha illallah. And we have a group of room, a room full of people, they never studied la ilaha illallah in their life ever. That's why I always wave this book around. This book is my best friend. This book is my best friend. Allah, the minimum, everything I tell you always, it's in here. Al usul al thalatha wa idillatuha. The three questions in a grave that you'll be asked. The Shaykh he mentions. La ilaha illallah. Wa ma'naha. La ma'buda bihaqqin illa Allah. He tells you what it means. La ilaha. Nafi'in jami'a ma yu'badu min duni Allah. Illa Allah. Muthbitan il ibadati illahi wahda. La sharika lahu fi ibadati. Kama annahu laysa lahu sharikun fi mulki. Wa tafsiruha alladhi yuwadduhuha. Then he explains it even further. Just la ilaha illallah. Whole section on it. You have to seek knowledge. Wallahi. Talab al-ilm faridatun ala kulli muslimin. Seeking knowledge is obligatory on every muslim. You don't have to become scholars, but you have to learn the basics. So that's, pray, that's la ilaha illallah. And the third thing, the minimum, is the salah, the prayer. Brothers, if you have this, my sisters, if you have this, then you're safe from the hell for eternity, inshallah. But we don't want to go to hell for even a second. So we want to come that step further. Subhanakallah, bihamdika shadu la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum, guys. We believe that everyone should have access to the obligatory things that they need to know, the obligatory knowledge that they need to know in order to be a Muslim on and worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to at least a basic level. Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Talab al-ilm faridatun ala kulli muslimin. Seeking knowledge is obligatory upon every single Muslim. In other words, it means if you're not seeking that obligatory knowledge that you need, that minimum knowledge that you need, then you and I could actually be sinning. In fact, we would be sinners by not, by not seeking that knowledge. But alhamdulillah, in order to solve that problem, we put together something called the Knowledge College. The Knowledge College is an online Islamic studies institute where we teach you how to study your religion. Brothers and sisters, you can start studying it right now by going to the link below, checking out the website, and hopefully if you like what you see, you can register inshallah ta'ala and start your pursuit of seeking knowledge. We start on a basic level and then alhamdulillah, we work our way up to the top. Let's do that together inshallah. Check out the link below, Knowledge College. See you there. Assalamu alaikum.